Joan Crawford might have been one of the most electric actresses of her generation, but her life was tarnished by tragic secrets from a young age. Most fans didn't know what she was going through until the very end. And then there were the feuds, guys. So many feuds. Ones you don't even know about. Yet. Even Crawford's start in Hollywood was controversial. Her real name was Lucille Lefay Lesueur, which producers cruelly laughed at. Instead, they decided to make her name Joan Crawford. The only problem? Crawford hated the stage name until the bitter end. And that kind of hatred soon consumed her career. It's no secret to say that Crawford has one of the most spiteful reputations in Hollywood history. And for good reason. Her notoriously competitive behavior started very early, when she was working as a body double at MGM for the studio's established star, Norma Shearer. Crawford considered Shearer her professional nemesis, especially since Shearer was married to a studio head and got the best parts. Crawford even once sniped, how can I compete with Norma? She sleeps with the boss. Well, it wasn't long before Joan learned from the best. Soon enough, at least if the rumors are to be believed, Crawford had no qualms using the casting couch as a bedroom, snagging roles through seduction. One such conquest, the married director Vincent Sherman, even admitted that Crawford had a quote, masculine approach to bedroom relations. It seemed to work out well for Crawford. By 1928, she was the next it girl after starring as a flapper in Our Dancing Daughters. And with fame came scandal. Around the same time she made the film, Crawford met and then quickly married Douglas Fairbanks Jr., the heir of old Hollywood power couple Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Racially enough, Fairbanks was only 19 years old, while Crawford was about four years older than him. But that was just the beginning. See, Crawford's new in-laws utterly despised her, and they made her feel it in cruel ways. Pickford and Fairbanks Sr. had a famous estate they nicknamed Pickfair, but they refused to invite the newlyweds to the sprawling property until eight months after the wedding. Even then, if Crawford was ever left alone with Pickford, the elder actress would often just retire to her rooms, aka abandon Joan. Yet, in some ways, Pickford was right to have it out for Crawford. Eventually, Crawford and her husband were both having affairs on each other, with Crawford taking up with Hollywood hunk Clark Gable in a very kinky tryst. I mean, get this. When a friend happened to stumble upon the two of them wrapped around each other in a public place, Crawford sent the woman a letter the next day that read, I bet you were thrilled watching. And Crawford's unbounded sensuality went even bigger places. When she was in her 30s, Crawford even seduced the teenage star Jackie Cooper, and she did it with some pretty strange bedroom habits. As Cooper later recalled, quote, she would bathe me, powder me, cologne me, then she would do it all over again. The thing is, Crawford did this kind of thing often. In his memoirs, actor Kirk Douglas recalled a particularly disturbing and bizarre romantic encounter when the two stars once went back to Crawford's house. In the middle of the act, Douglas reported, Crawford leaned in and murmured, You're so clean. It's wonderful that you shaved your armpits when you made champion. As Douglas put it, Crawford's passionate outburst was a real conversation stopper. But Joan could get genuinely dirty too. While on the set of 1947's Daisy Kenyon, Crawford fell into uncontrollable lust for her co-star Henry Fonda. So what did she do? Well, she got the costume department to create a custom red sequined jock strap, which she then presented to the star in a gift box. Stars, they're not like us. As a side note, Henry Fonda turned her down flat. So surprising no one, Crawford and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. soon split. And it wasn't long before Crawford married another actor, Franchot Tone. Somehow, this marriage was even worse. And tragic to boot. Crawford desperately wanted children, but although they tried twice to have them, both pregnancies ended in miscarriages that left Crawford exhausted and grieving. Tone's response did not help. Depressed and frustrated, Tone began drinking and, most terrifying of all, took his anger out on Crawford, physically harming her during their fights. Thankfully, Joan wasn't dealing with that and divorced him in 1939. But by then, it was already all unraveling. Just a year before she divorced Tone, an article infamously dubbed Joan Crawford box office poison, further harming her now dwindling career in the process. Suddenly, over the next few years, Crawford's life took on a frenzied quality. Although she adopted a daughter at long last, she didn't present a stable front as a mother. For one, she first named the girl Joan on a seemingly narcissistic impulse, and then quickly renamed her Christina. The next decade saw Crawford haphazardly adopting children, and there's really no other word for it than haphazardly. 
She went back and forth on more of their names and possibly, though maybe unintentionally, used a human trafficking ring to procure some of them. Even when Crawford won her first Academy Award for 1945's Mildred Pierce, something wasn't quite right. Namely, Crawford wasn't even at the ceremony. That's because right before, Crawford became convinced she was going to lose out to Ingrid Bergman and stayed home. Then, when she found out she actually won, she simply called up her makeup people and had an impromptu photo shoot on her bed to print in the next day's papers. Again, no, these were not the actions of a mentally stable person. Neither were her next ones. By the 1950s, Joan Crawford was officially a diva. While working on the western Johnny Guitar with Mercedes McCambridge, the two lead actresses butted heads the entire time. Probably because Crawford once slept with McCambridge's husband. But as you well know by now, that did not stop Crawford from twisting the knife in deeper. At one point on set, a drunken Crawford tossed McCambridge's clothes onto the highway, leaving them for cars to tread over. McCambridge would go on to call Crawford a, quote, mean, tipsy, powerful, rotten egg lady. But Crawford was no fan either. I have four children, she was said to have quipped about McCambridge. I do not need a fifth. And in the 1960s, Crawford struck up her most iconic rivalry. Everybody, and I mean everybody, knows that Betty Davis and Joan Crawford had a feud while working on the thriller Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. But the details are even juicier than you can imagine. For example, Davis once said of Crawford that she, quote, slept with every male star at MGM except Lassie. Only, as usual, Crawford's insult cut deeper. She immediately attacked Davis's acting ability, saying, Betty and I work differently. Betty screams, and I knit. While she screamed, I needed a scarf that stretched clear to Malibu. According to Betty Davis herself, there was one heartless route to her feud with Joan Crawford. Love. As it happened, both women went after Franchot Tone, but while Davis was head over heels, she obviously lost him to Joan, who married him. Just two years before she died, Davis admitted that Joan, quote, took him from me. She did it coldly, deliberately, and with complete ruthlessness. I have never forgiven her for that, and never will. Then in 1963, Crawford and Davis's feud took center stage in the most hostile way possible. At that year's Oscars, Davis received a nomination in the Best Actress category for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. And Crawford didn't. Yes, ouch. Stung to her core, Crawford put all of her cunning, and there was a considerable amount, into overdrive. Ahead of the ceremony, Crawford contacted all the other Best Actress nominees and graciously offered to accept any award on their behalf in the event that they couldn't attend the show. And here's the kicker. They were all located on the East Coast, far away from the ceremony, so it wasn't likely that they could attend. All Crawford had to do was wait. And sure enough, Betty Davis lost to Anne Bancroft in The Miracle Worker. Only, of course, Bancroft wasn't there. Instead, Joan Crawford waltzed out to accept her award, right in front of the loser Davis. It was a moment of petty triumph for the ages. But Joan was having problems of her own. Beyond all the feuds and the affairs, one filthy rumor dogged Crawford for her entire career. There were whispers that when she was just starting out in Hollywood, she starred in a racy stag film called Velvet Lips. This was so shameful to Crawford that her ex-husband said that although she admitted to starring in the film, she could never talk about it without bursting into tears. Yet for all that, no copy of Velvet Lips seems extant. And many historians believe that her studio tracked all the tapes down and destroyed them. As she reached her later life, Crawford just couldn't let go of, well, anything. At one point, Crawford's daughter Christina was working on the soap opera The Secret Storm, but had to bow out after a ruptured ovarian tumor. Ever the considerate mom, Crawford contacted the producers and offered herself as a replacement. Even worse, they agreed. But that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Crawford's parenting style. Joan Crawford eventually lived to be 73, passing in 1977. And when she died, her adopted brood of children seemed heartbroken. Until that is, the contents of her will revealed the dark truth. Although Crawford left her daughters Cindy and Kathy a small sum of money, she notoriously shut out her two other children, Christopher and Christina, for, quote, reasons which are well known to them. And those dark reasons soon came out. In 1978, while Crawford was still warm in her grave, her daughter Christina released her infamous tell-all book, Mommy Dearest. 
Although many contest the claims, the book alleges that Crawford emotionally and physically mistreated Christina and her brother Christopher. In particular, Crawford, who, if you remember her bedroom habits, was obsessed with cleanliness, hated wire hangers, and she would wake her children up in the middle of the night if they hung anything up on an ordinary hanger, let alone left a crumb on the floor. But I've saved Crawford's biggest secret for last. In Mommy Dearest, Crawford's daughter Christina even went so far as to slyly accuse Joan of offing her fourth husband, Pepsi mogul Alfred Steele. To be fair, Steele was found dead at the bottom of a flight of stairs and was buried without an autopsy. As Christina said, I don't believe it was an accident. I know what Mommy was capable of in a state of rage.